Hello everybody, it's Mike here at Game from Scratch. Today we are talking about Lumberyard. Lumberyard is Amazon's game engine, completely free with a couple caveats. We'll get back to that in a second. And the reason why we are talking about it today is because Lumberyard 1.21 was just released. Now this was actually the quickest release they have had in a very long time. The last one was in July or August. They normally don't release that quick between versions. And the flip side is there's not a ton in this actual release. So what we're going to do is first off, quick do a quick overview of what Lumberyard is, what Lumberyard is all about, and then we'll jump into what's new in this release. As I mentioned, it should be a pretty quick video. There's not a ton new here. Now here you can see this is Lumberyard in action. Now don't judge it by the performance you are seeing because quite frankly, uh, this is running on my laptop on battery power while visually capturing it. Suffice to say, this is not indicative of the kind of performance you will see from a dedicated dev machine, say for the 1080 or a 2070 machine, uh, but still, it's quite usable, it looks quite good, and that's always been one of the strengths of the engine Lumberyard is based on, CryEngine. CryEngine has always been a beautiful, if somewhat difficult to work with engine, and Lumberyard is a fork of CryEngine. Basically, back at CryEngine 3.4, Crytek was in trouble, Amazon gave them a bundle of cash, and since then, we have had two game engines built on top of CryEngine Source, Lumberyard and CryEngine. Now, they're completely different, they have nothing to do with each other anymore, so you can't take code from one and work with it in the other, anything like that. As of 3.4, they have diverged into completely different products. Now, the entire idea behind Lumberyard is that it is completely free to use, and that is actual full-on free with one gotcha. If you use online in your particular game, you need to pay them, um, or you need to use, so you need to negotiate a license, or you need to host your own servers, or you need to use Amazon services. So completely free, if you're making a single-player only game, Lumberyard, 100 100% free for you to use. If uh, you make uh, online and use their multiplayer for say it's EC2 or S3 or, or whatever for hosting online, you are fine. You have your own servers, you are fine. If you try to host on Microsoft Azure or Google App Engine or something else, you are not fine. So that is basically the way they make their money. Either you negotiate a special license with them or you... Um, use their online services. In most cases, uh, that's it. So basically, if you're going to use your online infrastructure through Amazon, it is an incredible deal. Is it the right engine for you? Well, that's hard to say, to be honest. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump in and take a look at what is new here, uh, mostly through the README. This is Lumberyard running uh, the Nemo example. It was released four or five months back. It's a very cool uh, example, and it demonstrates the, the newer scripting canvas. This is the, the recommended way of programming game logic. You can see here it is a visual programming language. And this is one of the areas we saw updates in this particular release. So it's a flowchart style, flow graph style uh, programming. Uh, we got some improvements across the board. We'll get back to some of the details of what's new when we get to the readme in just a second. But I will showcase the three new nodes. And these are pretty basic programming functions, but they're all very useful. So first off, we have a repeater node. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, you, your node comes in, you pick how many times to repeat, think of it as a loop, and how long each repetition takes. So if you want to do uh, something 30 times every um, two seconds, uh, you basically come in 30 reps, two seconds, and then this is the action that gets triggered, and then once those 30 reps are done, the complete is triggered. Pretty straightforward. Another concept or construct from programming that is very common is a switch statement. Switch statements can be thought of as uh, if else turned into a single thing. So basically you come in, you have your input, and then you can have an index. That's the value that comes in that you're going to switch off of. And then based off of the index, you add multiple different outputs. So this is, uh, you can have the different conditions come in based off of the switch. It's kind of a, an easier way of writing a number of if else's and so on. And then finally, we have the ordered, oops, ordered sequencer. And this one is incredibly straightforward. Basically, the node comes in and then this happens. And if you have multiple things you wanna have happen, you just keep adding them. So what'll happen is this node will fire and then it will do this and then this, and then this. Think of it like a queuing system. So you can have, you can order your tasks that are gonna happen after the fact uh, using the ordered sequencer. So those are three new nodes that they added in here. On top of that, they've done some new things for coloring and commenting and so on. We'll get to those when we hit the readme. And actually speaking of which, let's do that right now. So we're gonna head on over to the blog. Da, 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 da. So here is the AWS blog for Lumberyard 4.1. Ironically, there's a little bit here that's not in the release notes and vice versa. So we're actually gonna quickly go through both. But as I mentioned earlier on, there is not a ton in this particular release. So um, we mentioned already the three new constructs, the repeater, the switch, and the ordered sequencer that were added to Script Canvas. On top of that, Script Canvas gets greater flexible 
flexibility working with dynamic types, new comment, and group presets so you can define color code comments and groups, and the ability to disable nodes so you can test different graph structures more quickly. So if you want to, you know, basically comment out a bunch of code, you can just disable it and test. Um, we already talked about the three new features that were added in there. On top of that, they added the emotion effects animator. This is probably, or editor, sorry, this is probably the emotion effects animation editor is probably the biggest addition in this particular release. What they've done is given you the ability to do secondary animations. We'll get back to that when we get to read me because there's a good demonstration that explains what exactly that is all about. Uh, next up, Lumberyard implemented NVIDIA's Physics 4.1. That brings them to the most current version. Uh, across the board, that should give the physics system, if you're using physics for your um, physics simulation here, a performance, a stability, and an accuracy boost as a result. And they've also did a number of refactoring for the cross-platform architecture. This was really nice on the side of your code project. It really simplifies it. We'll see a good illustration of that when we get to the um, release notes in just two seconds. Uh, but instead of a whole bunch of if else codes, they kind of reorganized the cross platform. And this kind of, it, it didn't change a lot on your end. This is mostly a back end architecting thing for going forward. So here we are in the former release notes. Interestingly enough, there are no comments here about their visual scripting changes. So I, I don't get it. Anyways, um, we've got improvements. As I mentioned earlier on, the animation editor is better explained here. Uh, adjustable node features include stiffness factor, gravity factor, damping factor, simulation update rate, number of iterations, and ability to use colliders. What basically you can do is add secondary things. So you've got your character with bone animation going on. You can attach things to him, like a backpack or a cape or this little flap of material in a samurai outfit that I have no idea what it's called, but I guarantee at least one of you is going to know the name. So I look forward to reading it in the comments down below. But this is actually animated separate to this entire character. So if you have attachments to characters that have physics attached to them, that's what this new system enables you to do. So this tassel is what they called it, um, is being animated separately using the new simulated object node part of the animation editor. So that's probably the biggest new feature here. And I can definitely see uses for it, especially again, if you have backpacks or capes or so on. Um, launcher projects, uh, this is the update they talked about. So um, used to have nine different platform specific projects for Visual Studio Code and, and um, Xcode. So when you wanted to go in and test a different one, you basically, um, required you to change the startup project and debug target in Visual Studio each time for each platform, very time consuming. Now they have basically one. So you see the reorg here. This is the way launchers were in the code before. So you got like project windows launcher, uh, so on and so forth. You got a ton of different ones, game Xenia launcher, windows launcher, game Provo launcher, and so on. Now, you basically have a much more streamlined set of code. Again, mostly on the back end. They've also got some instructions on how to migrate um, existing projects up to the new settings. Again, physics was improved. Um, kind of it. And we're actually at the end of what is in this particular release. So realistically, what we saw here was the new um, options under visual scripting, the new animation editor, and a bump to physics. Not a huge amount in this particular release. Now, there's one last thing that is here as part of the refactoring. The, those of you that are clinging to 30-bit XP, you are getting one step closer to death with every new tool that is released. And more and more people are canceling 32-bit platforms. Uh, right now, all new Android, new Android devices are 64-bit. All new iOS devices are 64-bit. And basically every operating system out there is 64-bit. So I get the idea behind it, but there's a lot of Android applications out there, or devices out there that are still 32-bit. Um, there's a handful of operating systems out there that are 32-bit, and you are not going to be able to target them with Lumberyard anymore. Is this functionally a big deal? Eh, to be honest, if you're developing a AAA-style game using Lumberyard today, you don't care about 32-bit. Now, if you're an indie developer, do you care about 32-bit? I'm not really sure, actually. I, I honestly, I don't have an opinion here. I haven't been on a 32-bit platform in eons, but I, I know some of you definitely like like XP, for example, um, the 32-bit the version of it anyways, for whatever reason. Uh, so I'd be interested to know, because I know a lot of Linux users were really screwed when there was a recent 32-bit purge, and they had to walk it back. I forget the exact details of that, but I know there, there are sometimes some ramifications of getting rid of 32-bit platforms. So let me know what you think of that particular change down below. And realistically, that is the update to Lumberyard. It's, it's one of these engines. I don't know what it is about it, because... In some ways, this is more targeted at like A to triple A kind of size studios, not not giant or uh, indie, you know, uh, the, the, the marquee project out there is the most funded game in history, the uh, 
Oh God, what is it called? Star Citizen. That that is the biggest project out there, and it's got what half a billion dollars in funding or something, and it's using Lumberyard. Um, a lot of Amazon in-house stuff is using Lumberyard, but there's not a ton of other stuff out there. The Top Gear game was made using Lumberyard, um, and I don't really think it's that indie appropriate. I can't think of a ton of reasons for an indie, a couple of developer-sized team to use something like this over Unity or Unreal. Um, again, obviously, Unreal charges you that six or seven percent royalty, and Unity has a a per license cost for professional games. So there is a financial incentive for certain size teams. So I, I get it. I just don't know if, if the end user, the, the indie developer, a lot of this channel's audience, if you're interested in using this engine or not. Now, one thing they've definitely got to do is get the install process down because uh, it's still gross. Now, for example, to install Lumberyard 1.21, download the Nemo code, rebuild the Nemo code, how long do you think this process took? For example, it was on a one gigabyte internet connection uh, using an i7 uh, with 16 gigs of RAM and a 1080 GPU. How long do you think it took me from beginning to actually being able to run this guy without running it into any technical snafus? Like this is literally the download the requirements and do a rebuild process. How long do you think that took? If you answered seven hours, you're right. And if you're wondering how big Lumberyard is, well, if it's configured to, um, let's say, uh, rebuild the engine and all of the tools and everything else, so if you've got full, all fat, everything that you need to work with Lumberyard here, uh, this, this, this is how big it is. <laughs> 70, uh, 75, almost 76 gigabytes of disk space. Now, the smallest impact you can have for Lumberyard is still about... 30, 31, but that's still insane. That, that is the biggest game engine by a country mile that I can think of. I'm actually curious, are there any installs that even come close to 75 gigabytes for a game engine? Uh, I think currently un, like archived uh, Unreal Engine is around four gigabytes, so probably 10 extracted. Uh, Unity is maybe two gigabytes. Godot is like, I don't know, 18 bytes. It's insane how big this game engine is, especially because CryEngine, based off the same code base, is down to like two or three gigabytes per install. So yeah, there are, the install process definitely has to be streamlined and that that build process needs to shrink. I, like I know in a AAA studio, who gives a damn about 75 gigs of storage or losing a day to upgrade to the newest version, but uh, I care about that kind of stuff. It does make it incredibly frustrating to work with at times. So anyway, so that is Lumberyard 1.2.1, uh, improvements to script canvas. We've got uh, the new physics 4.1. And of course, we've got the new animation editor features. Let me know what you think of Lumberyard in general and this release. Do you like them releasing with less new features, but more often? That's definitely a good thing, I suppose. But I suppose I would actually prefer more new features more often, but hey, we can't always get everything. Let me know what you thought this release this engine, everything else, comments down below, and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye for now.